Hey there guys, Cameron here. Welcome back. I'm going to be walking through a really quick discounted cash flow or DCF model with you today. Oftentimes because I find, and let's face it, sometimes you just want to quickly do an analysis of a potential opportunity and you either don't have the time to be doing a large intricate model, which may only provide relatively marginal benefit and or you may already have a pretty big model at your disposal, but then you might have to go back through, check all the assumptions, check that formula are working correctly and things like that. Oftentimes I find in practice, it's just quick to have a nice, easy, one page, relatively simple model to do some sort of analysis with when deciding whether or not to, to invest or not. Apologies that it's been a little while since I last uploaded a vi uh, video. I think the last one would have been actually before I went down to the US and since then have gotten involved in some more investments myself. So been very busy, a good busy, but uh, nonetheless wanted to get back and provide um, another sort of tutorial for you guys. And again, this model is going to be made free as always at my website www.lotusglobalassets.com forward slash resources. Without further ado, let's get in and pick apart this model. So <clears throat> starting from the top, as we always do, we've got some of the pretty standard assumptions that you want to put into uh, the potential opportunity, uh, things like the property name, um, the the asking price, the investors required return, and this is going to come into play. I'll show you later in the actual discounting of the cash flows. Um, got some debt assumptions, and then you've got your monthly repayment. Now the payment using the KMT function. So all this is going to be doing is taking your periodic, not the yearly, interest rate, and uh, dividing it by the number of periods, I'm oh, sorry, factoring in the number of periods, also looking at the current loan present value. Just to quickly point out too, is that you'll notice that I use the named cells. Now months is a pretty common one. And really all that does is save you a little bit of time. It's a little bit more intuitive when you are typing it into a formula to be able to type months, which actually represents 12 in this case, as in nearly all cases and also helps when you're linking to formulas if you want to drag and drop you don't have to make use of the anchoring all the time and it really just kind of helps prevent against errors from formulas being dragged around and so on and so forth you've got the some rent rent roll assumptions just some basic ones so in this case we've got <clears throat> a total of 25 units a mixture of studio one bed and two bed uh, units with the corresponding monthly rent and your total rent here. And then last but not least, you've got your terminal cap rate and your selling costs, which are just some pretty standard assumptions that are going to come into play when we model the returns at the bottom of the cash flow. So working from top to bottom, in terms of the income, I've really just tried to simplify this as much as possible. So we've got some overly simplified inflation assumptions, perhaps it allows you to quickly just change the assumed inflation rate. Now, your guess is as good as mine, but feel free to go in here and change the percentage. The impact that that's going to have is to just change the assumed growth of these income components. So rent, other, and recoverables. Okay. The recoverables uh, component is actually something worth pointing out. And it's something that I've seen in different markets. So I've seen it called uh, conservancy fees, um, seen it called service charge. And really what this is, and it, it applies to mainly to common areas. So you can think lobby or reception, whereby basically all of the occupants within 
a shared building, let's say it's a large building that all 25 of these units are in, all chip in to cover the costs of the shared amenities. So again, we use the lobby or reception as an example. And so on one hand, you've got the money coming in. So in this case, I've just assumed a few grand a year. That's going to be all chipped in from the tenants or the occupants. And then on the other hand, you're going to be paying that out because ultimately this is um, maintenance that is being done on the property in theory. And so this will also be reflected in the expense component as well. Now, you, you won't see it called out explicitly. So here it could just be very well bundled within repairs and maintenance and or management. It's but similar. I've uh, made the vacancy assumptions really easy. We're looking at this on a yearly basis. So we aren't going to get too in depth. Again, this is really just to provide a quick sort of analysis, not to to press go and move forward with the investment. So I didn't want to overly complicate it. So moving from your potential gross income, then it's going to bring you to your effective gross income. Next, we're going to look at the. Uh, associated with operating the investment so you've got pretty standard costs I'm not going to go into detail on any one of these in particular again with the same mechanism that you can easily just increase or reduce the assumed inflationary costs or inf um, inflationary growth which is going to increase these costs accordingly that'll take you to your net operating income of course subtract out any capex that's expected and that'll get you to your cash flow from operations so you've got your debt service uh, this is pretty straightforward it's really just the monthly payment that we calculated above multiplied by the number of months and that gets you to your cash flow before tax uh, Part below is just, I wanted to add in a few different metrics of risk, which you may or may not want to consider. We've spoken previously about uh, the debt service coverage ratio, for example. I've added in a couple other bits that are just probably worthwhile to keep track of as you're moving along or as you want to see how the investment progresses. So in this case, we've got the loan balance. And really what this is doing is just taking the uh, present value of the loan balance outstanding. <clears throat> so what you want to do is take your yearly interest rate, subtract by or divide by the number of months. So it's going to get you to your periodic interest rate. Once again, you've got your number of periods, but this time what you're going to be doing is subtracting the number of periods that have already uh, lapsed. And then you've got your monthly payment that you're making towards the combination of principal and interest. So actually what I can do, just change this loan balance header to end of year to specify because again, what we're doing is subtracting out of the fact that a year has now lapsed. This is the outstanding loan balance after one year of operations. That service coverage ratio, again, we've gone into this in previous models. Basically, all it's doing is saying, right, what's your net operating income as a percentage of the debt service obligations that you have? <clears throat> Comes into play if you are doing larger loans, uh, you know, loan syndication, and it could be part of the covenant that they want to have included in uh, the loan agreement itself. So something that is often worthwhile tracking because in some cases, if you do fall below that debt service coverage ratio threshold, the lender is within their right to um, to pull the loan, to rescind the loan. <clears throat> and last but not least, we've got debt yield. Pretty straightforward. It's just your cash flow, uh, your net operating income as a percentage of the outstanding loan balance. And then move along, so start to take a look at returns, the arguably most interesting part. 
top portion here is your unlevered returns. So once again, just looking at the returns as if you were to pay for it 100% in cash, i.e. not using any sort of debt or leverage. So you've got your assumed purchase price, your cash flow from operations, and then you've got your uh, sale at the end less the selling costs. Now again, you may ask, well, why have I gone into the 11th year if it's a 10-year investment horizon in this case? Well, we always use the forward NOI. So in this case, what's being done for the uh, assumed exit price or terminal price is the forward NOI capitalized at the <clears throat> terminal cap rate that we've got assumed here at the top. And then so we've got the return on your investment. I've just put it in there free and clear again because there's no sort of um, uh, debt obligations assumed in these returns. Now, in the assumptions above, clearly we are using debt, which is why we've got the debt service, but that's going to come into our example or the returns analysis below. And so on an unlevered basis, our internal rate of return is just shy of 8%. And the equity multiple, which actually we can just go ahead and call the project multiple, because this is the return of the project itself. If you were to use 100% equity, you don't need to specify that it's an equity multiple because it's all equity because you're not using any debt in these assumptions. Now, once again, this is just really a sum of looking at your cash flows takes a sum of all the positive cash flows divided by the sum of all the negative cash flows. And what this is saying is that for every hundred dollars, pounds, et cetera, that you invest, you're going to receive 189 back. And then below we've got the levered returns analysis. So same story, except this time you're going to be factoring in the loan that we're assumed to receive, which of course is then going to mean that only 900,000 as opposed to 2.25 million is invested of your own cash, of your, of your equity. <clears throat> and of course, though, we have to take the after debt service uh, cash flows in our returns analysis. And as we would expect to see, or as we would hope to see, the cash on cash return, meaning the return purely on the equity that you've contributed without having to factor in the additional uh, debt layered in, is higher compared to the unlevered. Likewise, the internal rate of return is also higher as it should be because we're taking on more risk and we're having to contribute less equity. Finally, for the equity multiple, in the example that I just explained above, for every hundred pounds or dollars or whatever that you're investing, you'd be receiving 189 back in the unlevered instance, whereas you'd be receiving 289, so an extra 100 back uh, if you were to incorporate this amount of leverage. And last but not least, of course, this is a TCF, so we want to be including the, uh, the impact of the time value of money. Now, what's an appropriate discount rate? Well, you'd want to look at the required unlevered, we've assumed here, unlevered rate of return that we assumed at the top. Basically, we've you can think of the required unlevered rate of return as the opportunity cost. So if the deal isn't going to stack up, in other words, if the project isn't going to be cash flowing or earning enough money to meet these requirements, arguably you as an investor could be investing elsewhere and earning this type of return. So in order to meet your minimum investment threshold, this is the minimum investment 
return that it would have to yield. And so hence, when we're factoring in the actual cash flows, we want to look at today's value would be if we discount it or brought it to today's dollars or pounds or whatever the units of currency are using the required rate of return as the discount factor. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're taking our uh, cash flow from operations, doing a discount. So you can see here in the formula, te uh, formula bar, take the, uh, take regular cash flow from operations prior to discounting having at this factor, raising it to the number of periods, in other words, the number of years. And when we do that, we get to a present value, which is just a sum of all these cash flows, we get to a present value of two point, roughly 2.4 million. So if you were to flick back up at the top, compare this 2.4 million present value, given your turn requirement, to the asking price, you might therefore come to a conclusion that, yes, this is a sensible investment. At a 2.25 million purchase price, you can make this deal work within your investment criteria. And last but not least, we've got the unlevered cash on cash return, which once again, is just a cash flow from operations as a percentage of the present value of all the cash flows for this project. Nice and easy. And that takes us to the end. Like I said, I will be uploading this video onto the website, www.lotusglobalassets.com. And please feel free to visit the website, download it. It's always going to be free, freely available. And please do let me know if there's anything that you spot that's out of order or if you have any questions or anything like that, you can also watch this YouTube video on YouTube on my uh, on the company's YouTube channel. Just search for Lotus Global Assets. And that's it. Thanks a lot, guys. Hope this was helpful for you. And speak to you again soon. Take care.